Hello, and welcome to DWeb Decoded, uh, the podcast devoted to all things decentralized, and in particular, the decentralized web, and in particularly the particular, uh, the bits of the Filecoin and IPFS uh, ecosystem that touch on those topics. The people we talk to uh, on this podcast are either people who've been inspired by decentralizing technology, or actually the people who are kind of an inspiration for its use. And uh, my guest today is Peter Kaufman, who's been in the forefront of one of the topics that um, I think a lot of people get involved in decentralization to pursue, uh, which is the spread of knowledge and open knowledge in particular. Peter, I know who you are. What do you think you are? Um, how much time do we have? Danny, great, uh, to, yeah. Yeah, great, <laughs> great, great to be with you here. Um, I work as senior program officer at MIT uh, Open Learning, which uh, has within its remit uh, open courseware, one of the great, I think, gifts uh, to education uh, out there. Uh, um, and I also do some writing and uh, video uh, production work. And you use you, your background is in, well, it's hard to say because it's sort of always been the amalgam of the literary world and the visual world, right? You did um, a, uh, uh, you, 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 you ran um, uh, Intelligent Television, uh, which is a video production company about sort of cultural and educational institutions in general. Mm -hmm. uh, You've you've been a book publisher, right? In the past, is that true? Yeah, I mean, I've, yeah. you know, there's a lot of electroshock therapy that's gone into trying to allow me to forget those years, but I've been in, I've been in, in publishing too. And um, I'm sort of interested in oh, and like uh, you have a new book coming out about the moving image. Is that something that we can exclusively reveal? Yeah, no, that is, yeah, that's an exclusive to, yeah, what is it, page six in the New York Post and, and this and this FFDW podcast. Um, MIT Press will publish a book. Uh, it's currently called The Moving Image, A User's Guide. Um, it's sort of a Chicago manual of style, but for how to use video. Oh, wow. And it begins, I guess, with a meditation on the fact that we've reached the point that the people who wrote the Chicago Manual, you know, uh, felt they had reached back in like the early 1900s. And in fact, the elements of style, uh, which is the number one assigned book on a university course syllabi, uh, also, uh, you know, came out in the first part of the 1900s. And I think video has reached a place now where we can talk about it in some of the, some of the same ways. And, um, yeah, that's not a, that's a, it's a conversation to be had, not without some conversation pieces, uh, addressing the decentralization. So is yeah. this sort of like a doc is, is the idea that this is a document of kind of tropes or approaches that you can use in, in video that have kind of become established in the same way as like, you know, the style of English writing was beginning to become kind of fixed at that yeah, point. Yeah, there's, I mean, exactly that. There's a, there's a, there's a bit of history at the, at the start of the book um, that compares videos evolution to the evolution of print. Um, reminds us that, you know, print has had like a 440 year head start on the moving image, I guess, if you, Gutenberg's stuff is like, 1540s and you know the Lumiere brothers started their public screenings in the 1890s so if the math is good and it's supposed to be good given where I work like I have to make sure it's sharp you know um 440 years head start and we have to make sure that like print which has turned into a universe that's completely tied up in all kinds of rights and knots and unbelievable permissions culture like um can we can we try to keep video the moving image film television all of it like um from going down the same 
you know, pathway of full of mistakes and rubble. So it includes includes um, chapter on how to cite video. Oh, interesting. Which is a huge issue, right? Like, right. If, how do you tell the history of January 6th, for example, in the future? You mentioned, you know, that people might be, God help them, you know, watching this podcast five years from now. Um, you know, it, the historians who tell the story of January 6th, you can't really tell that story fully without recourse to the... Uh, millions of pieces of evidence that are audiovisual. It's it's odd how the web we don't really think about the, how the web is such a sort of literary device, right? It's it's based around the written word. Yeah. You know, Tim Berners-Lee fashioned it to share academic papers, which as the name implies, a very, you know, written down um and it was an extension of that idea of citation to have hyperlinks to be able to point to those things. But then we sort of bolted video on top of that in a way that 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 sort of is hard to like integrate in, in, in the same way. Um, when I'm talking about decentralization, people often kind of, you know, want to get an example of what kind of effect it would have. And I feel kind of awkward because the one that really is sort of still in people's living memory is, is YouTube, even though YouTube is completely centralized and run by, by Google, the fact that that gave the power to people to make small video and TikTok too, right? Make small videos and then convey it to other people was something that was utterly inexpressible before it actually, it actually happened. And like, also not, I wouldn't have been able to predict how, how it played out. I mean, how important is video to how education unlike remote and online education works these days. I mean, there, there's so many great topics and questions embedded within that one that you ended on. Like if Wikipedia were to start today, you know, um, chances are it wouldn't be primarily a text. Right. Universe. Uh, the internet archive, um, led by Brewster Kale. I mean, that, that, that place has figured uh, um, very carefully on the, you know, equal role that sound right. files and video uh, files of all kinds um, play in our information ecosystem. Now it's a rare example, uh, but a shining one um, of th this kind of thinking that's essential um, and that reflects basically where people uh, live today because they also have the device in their pockets, so many of them, that's got a camera and a speaker and a screen. Um, you know, uh, um, for education, I think it's fair to say that it's a growing um, it's 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 growing in importance every minute video, you know, uh, the pandemic shut down schooling for hundreds of millions of people. And we had to move to screen based education. Um, but MIT has been involved in that for uh, literally decades now, um, establishing best practices, um, exemplifying them and you know we have to prepare ourselves for future hybrid environments uh, not to make everybody panic and shut their laptops and turn off this podcast but things might things might come around again you know with with another form of covid or some unpredictable disaster and we might not be able to gather in person and or we might want to benefit from the knowledge that exists uh, outside of physical reach. That to me is the positive side of things. How interesting is it, you know, to have, well, this might not be the finest example, at least as far as I'm concerned, but, you know, uh, you know, to have elements like this in your learning experience where a conversation can happen literally, 
you know, two people from opposite ends of the country connecting at the same time. So I'm, I didn't realize this when we, when we first sort of like, um, work together with uh, the Falcone Foundation of the Decentralized Web. So we're working with MIT's um, Open Learning to kind of explore how decentralizing tools could could, could help with the mission. But um, I think it was before that that, that um, Juan Bennett, who uh, is the sort of creator of IPFS and, and, um, and one of the key developers of Falcone, um, wrote to you and pointed out that the he, he was growing up in Mexico City, and he suddenly, from there, had access to MIT's back catalog of fairly hardcore um, education about computer science, about mathematics, about you know the entire. Um, I don't know whether it's it, whatever the opposite of or whatever the complement to humanities is as a, mm-hmm. as a curriculum that you would want to know about. Um, and I mean, I've had the same experience. So the structure and interpretation of computer programs is the thing that people would talk about in hushed tones when mm-hmm. I was at college that like, well, in MIT, you don't get any of this C programming language stuff. They teach you the, the, the hardcore things. And then, during COVID, I was like, wait, this is all available on MIT's open courseware. And I think the thing that's interesting with that is it's recorded um, in the 80s. So uh, it shows both kind of like that MIT has been doing this for quite some time. And two, this stuff is actually, when you catch it right, is perennial. Like I came away with an education there that still serves me in good stead um, now from stuff that was being taught 30 years ago in a very otherwise fast moving course do you so when you're doing open course where do you do you pick and choose do you do you just take what you're given by the um by faculty how do you turn something that is taught to mit students into something that you can prepare and give to the rest of the world i mean there are now over 2500 mit courses uh, out there online uh, for free to anyone, anywhere, without registration, uh, forever. I mean, the forever part might be, you know, something that uh, IPFS and and Filecoin can help with. Um, It's an extraordinary, it's an extraordinary presence uh, out there. And there's a commitment to render all of these courses uh, free, you know, free uh, on, on the web moving forward uh and it's true like juan uh bill gates other visionaries um um you know left right and center wherever you want to put them um technology visionaries have made use of uh sciences math humanities um all that mit has to offer on online it's it's one of the I, I'm in part of open learning that does resource development, um, which means if you have a resource, I'm going to develop it. Um, but also like strategic initiatives, which is, you know, establishing sort of different types of interactions with MIT faculty and staff and, and thinking through how to build communities. Um, uh, maybe some communities that we build will be as robust and exciting as the Filecoin social impact community, which we're proud um, to be a part of. But um, yeah, there's a lot of thinking that goes around uh, open learning and MIT more generally uh, about how to share knowledge um, more freely everywhere. So one of the parts, so I'm going to plug your other book. I'm impressed by people just right kind do it to the camera. Is that how we do? Except it's reversed, right? So no, no, it I'm looks probably, good. Is is it's, it's reversed in my thing. Okay. Um, so that's the the new enlightenment, and I think new and the new enlightenment is is a. I 
felt weird saying it's a great reminder because I feel like this has been the driving force of the web and certainly like this sort of return to a decentralized model Mm -hmm. as a way of distributing and sharing and producing knowledge. Mm -hmm. And you draw a line in this book through the same sort of waves of empowerment that have happened uh, classically since the original enlightenment, but before Mm -hmm. then and after then in the movie industry, in um, the, the push for the internet. Um, And I find it sort of interesting because these things prompt not only a sort of redistribution of existing knowledge, but, but always come with a wave of knowledge creation. Like the more people who have access to what has gone before, um, the more we get a variety of, of new ideas coming out of it. What do you think, what do you, like, what do you think are sort of like the new ideas that came from the early explosion in television? Um, I, and then the uh, the early explosion explosion of the internet. Like I feel we have enough distance now, maybe from both of them, to understand how they changed. Like the the what things in particular, what classes of things did they did they create and enable? Well, to me, like there are two sets of really interesting sort of answers, I guess, questions, answers. I don't know along those lines that you've raised. Like one is. People have talked about like the arc of the universe and whether it bends toward justice or whatever. And does the arc of the freedom or the information universe like bend toward freedom or not? Is there a kind of, you know, teleology at play where you start like, you know, you invent the wheel and then you invent the sail and then you have like a bicycle and then a car and a sailboat and a steam engine and a rocket or a plane or a rock like you know we we somehow there are advances in civilization that are technological in nature theoretically those are building progress and are there advances in the way we share knowledge or communicate with one another you know first through i don't know print and then radio and movies and television and the web and stuff. And, and are they, are they enabling greater knowledge sharing? Um, or, and then are there lessons within each of those kind of vectors, sectors, business models, if you would, they become business models for good or ill, like where we can learn from, um, we can learn from mistakes um, that have been made as well as, you know, good things. When you speak of television, public broadcasting began like when this, when, when film first started, which I devote a couple chapters of in, in my book, there were all of these societies that cropped up the society for visual education, you know, and there were like literally a dozen with names like, the visual society education, the education society for the visual society, (laughs) like a hundred things like this. They weren't very, and you know, they were all thinking about how to use this great new screen culture for education and public broadcasting grew out of that directly. In fact, it has some antecedents even in the late 1800s, which is crazy to imagine, but it's true. And, and the promise of public broadcasting, as defined in a kind of commission that the former president of MIT actually led, which created the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, had just the most, the loftiest, most inspiring goals uh, you could imagine. And you know what, we've, we haven't, we haven't really reached them yet. And in part, we haven't reached them because television has become in this country, at least, an unbelievable commercial, um, I don't know, this is a family show, so I'm going to choose my words like um, morass, you know? I enjoy the idea that, that there are groups of, 
perhaps that's the lofty goal that there would be a group of you know yeah. parents and children sitting that's around the, yeah. the, the 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 youtube watching this but yeah yeah right 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 it's in the in the bunker you know right yeah. <laughs> in 20 in 2028 yeah. yeah the um so so yeah so that's sort of like the i mean you're sort of casting it as as sort of a mis not a mistake but a learning right that you can have is that whatever new medium you create whether it's oh my goodness we'll be able to like spread copies of the bible much more easily right. or right. academic papers you're going to quickly find that the public service part of that is a small percentage of the Hollywood budget that emerges from it. Um, is that something that you fight against? Is it that you basically kind of have to, that the equilibrium, the visibility of educational materials is based on how hard someone like MIT put, pushes to put that into the mainstream you know or is it just a constant it's a it's a great question again um like i'm giving a talk tomorrow with our ocw team and that's open courseware yeah open sorry yeah. open courseware um and like we're super excited in that mit open courseware this year will surpass five million youtube subscribers on its youtube channel which which makes it the most watched sort of educational channel channel on YouTube or in effect probably the, the web. Um and I'm far in excess of like the number of people have ever attended MIT, I imagine. Right, which is a you know a, a weird but true blessing for MIT educators who can reach all kinds of corners of the but I think you know because you mentioned the, the word fight. It's in the title of my book on the new enlightenment. It's like, you know, we know something about who we're doing all this for, which is people who are keen to get more knowledge, like the courses you might've watched or want watch growing up. And, and, um, but it's super important also to remember who we're kind of doing this against, you know, um, like, um, who are the forces that are trying to ban books, stop teaching uh, in certain subjects, um, forbid people to speak here, there, um, rip people off of platforms, uh, you know? And so like, it is an unbelievably positive experience to go into these meetings and talk about these milestones that we've reached and stuff. Um, but there's so much still left to do. 5 million subscribers is great, but as I'll point out tomorrow, if the world has roughly 8 billion people, that means we're not reaching 7.99999, you know, like billion. Yeah. Growth mindset, though, Peter. I mean, you growth know, mindset. It couldn't, it could only go up. That's the market um, opportunity. So th th this is this is a super interesting way of thinking about it, right? Because I, I it was definitely my experience and the experience of others where you sort of go in, going information for free, like knowledge for everyone. Who could be possibly against that? Oh, quite a lot of people actually. And like, not just, you know, I don't want to portray them as like, you know, devils or anything. Like people often have extremely good reasons for um, at least arguing against the, I'm trying to steel man their argument, right? But the uncontrolled distribution of information and um, and partly it's because like, you know, the Prometheus story does not end well for Prometheus, even if it, if it does for humankind, right? No one likes someone who is taking the basis of a, a, of, of a power in the world, right? And then decentralizing it and distributing it to lots of people without an obvious 
compensation or award for the people who who may feel that they have some some ownership over it, right? Um, and I guess I guess right now the story of the first ninth decade or so of the internet was um, uh, a story of a fight over that kind of idea of ownership, right, and copyright. And I think that is coming back, and we can talk about that a little. Um, but I think the other thing that we're seeing right now is people genuinely concerned that two things. One is that information is falling into the hands of people who shouldn't have it, um, whether that's, you know, children or Iranians. <laughs> um, uh, and the second one is information, the knowledge that isn't knowledge at all, that is disinformation or, 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 or false in some way that's hard to deduce. So I guess kind of going through though, as, a, as an advocate for open knowledge, how do you deal with both of those, um, those arguments? Well, it's a great start, like Prometheus. Um, the book that I wrote does not go far that, back that far, but it goes back to the story of William Tyndall, who, um, you know, was trying to translate the Bible and did. And actually, we owe so much of the English language, so many of the idioms that we have today to this work of this guy, this polyglot from the 1500s. And he didn't end well either. He was burned at the stake and strangulated at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and as I, you know, remind my colleagues, you know, we all have bad days, but that that's a particularly rough one, you know, when the flames are, you know, going hard to up. come back from. Yeah, and then you and then you hard to come hard to come back from. <laughs> well said, yeah. Hard to come back from. Uh Giordano Bruno apparently was burned at the stake, but they decided he had transgressed so mightily that they turned him upside down, so head first. Uh, that's also a drag. But um, yeah, the story of Prometheus and the story of various Prometheuses often doesn't end well. And one of the things that's probably worth examining is, you know, where did this idea come from that all, all ideas are automatically property or all of, all of the creations that we make, whether it's a song or a you know piece of a poem or a course or a uh i don't know that uh you know if left undisturbed the original inhabitants of the american continent would have necessarily approached um you know knowledge in in this way evidence suggests that they might not have and I don't know if it's the wisest thing to do. And it's also not natural in the sense that copyright law, the way we constructed it in the Enlightenment, in the 1700s, the Statute of Anne and all that, all those, you know, British people were involved in, like, um, um, the, the, it's not uh, my fault. Yeah, that's right. I'm tagging <laughs> you. I'm tagging you with this. Uh, at least the good part. The good part is that the you know there's a public domain concept, right? And ultimately, that's where this stuff is supposed to end up. After there's a certain period which has been enlarged by various moneyed interests, lobbies for them. Um, after there's a certain period of exploitation, let's say, in the best sense and, and the worst sense. Um, the property is supposed to become our common heritage and out there for free. So if that's the, like the essential principle, where, why do we get trapped into the thought processes where everything is, as soon as I utter it, you know, a, 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 um, or write it down like a copyright or, or get filmed. By the way, I hope the license on this video is CC BY. Everything, everything is. Right. So uh, we're, we're an only, yeah, we're mm -hmm. an only open um, ecosystem. Partly because that's the that's the thing that both keeps us going, 
in the it means that everything can be reused, which is sort of an advantage. But it also keeps you honest, right? In the the it's really it's really easy to fall into into that state of mind, right? Because you you get very protective of your children. Um, and I think one of the things that was a big moment for me was realizing that a lot of people's intuition about what copyright and intellectual property should do was less about remuneration. Uh, although, I mean, that's, that's sort of, you know, the reasoning and, and the important thing, but it's about credit. And it's also about uh, control in that sense of, you know, I don't want somebody who I don't like benefiting from, from, from what I do in a very explicit way. So it's sort of about exclusion. And, and these are things that, like, you know, we do struggle with when you decentralize because one of the impetuses to, to, put things in one place and one place only is so you can keep an eye on what's happening to it. Right. Um, I hear this all the time, like just to give you, you know, I mean, this is true of a lot of these technologies, but just to pluck IPFS, right. People know that if they put a website up on, you know, Vis Vassell or, or Google or whatever, um, uh, they will have, some tracking, right? They will be able to see who sees their stuff and where they're from, and they can see it on a big map. And they feel uncomfortable with the idea of a decentralized system where that isn't true, right? Like if if it's stored and accessible across everything, um, then you won't get to see who's seeing it because they might be seeing it from the from someone else's computer. And I understand that loss of control, but of course the flip side is is having that kind of central control is exactly the thing that led to this sort of surveillance capitalism kind of model, right? Like you have that power to see every everything and therefore you end up using it. Do you, um, do you, do, do you ever feel like, does MIT ever feel the need to know how many people are watching, like what they're doing with these things? Do you feel that you lose out if you don't know that information? Because you 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 mirror it, right? You give it to other institutions to distribute themselves. There's no uh, surveillance, uh, and oddly, very little capitalism associated with MIT Open Courseware. In the sense that you don't have to register. Uh, you know, um, YouTube might have some metrics on the people who are like you know signed into Google one way or another. Um, but the MIT Open Learning platform doesn't really tr track um, stuff like that, or uh, you know, it. Uh, so there, there are trade-offs in the sense that yeah, it'd be great to know more, um, but the freedoms that you know and the ethos um, that govern open courseware, um, uh, yeah, aren't aren't. Um, allowing us to s support it. Um, and, you know, the, the, the challenge of it, encouraging people to give it away under even more free licenses, which could be done, open courseware carries within it, um, you know, most of the, almost every single one of the courses that get released have a license that I would consider not the most liberal of the licenses that Creative Commons offers or, you know, the new public license or any of that other stuff, you know, and there could be room. Um, there is room. There could be movement uh, toward that room for um, making it more freely available. Are there people who like teach? Uh, this is uh, the Chiron should, just yes, 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 there are. Um, are there people, it's like a rhetorical question, Edith are there people known. who like teach stuff who don't necessarily want their lectures made into a capital, capitalizable ob a commercial object by somebody in another place? You bet. But there's like this parable. I'm a Russianist, so I learned this parable as a difference between, you know, I studied Kremlinology, which is useful skill in the academy even now. But um. 
uh, sort of, uh, you know, um, I learned this parable involving a American farmer and a Ukrainian peasant farmer, American Midwestern farmer. The American farmer um, has five head of cattle and his neighbor has five head and gets five more head. So all of a sudden, 10 head of cattle. The American farmer is going to look at this. This is the way the Russians used to tell it, uh, anti-Ukrainian perhaps as they might be. And and um, the Russians weren't born or have relatives in the Ukraine, which is, and, and they would say the American farmer will look at that and get five more cattle to match his neighbors. And the Ukrainian farmer will climb over the fence at night after, you know, a bottle of Samogon or two moonshine and, and um, slit the throats of the five additional cattle that his neighbor had just to keep him even at the five, you know, cow to five cow quota. And, and uh, you know, what we don't want is a, is a web that incur or a universe that encourages the second thing. We want to figure out how do you inspire people to, to, to up their game in a way so that when there's growth, they grow too, as opposed to being against the growth of others. It's super, super tough dynamic, but one we have to figure out. So it's definitely true that what we're seeing now, and I think this is probably why it's such a good moment for your, your next book, is people producing courseware of their own right? Like people, like you go, I think it's just true that now if people want to learn how to do something, they will go to YouTube. Like YouTube strangely has one of its many versions of this is that it's the place that you go to learn how to fix your toilet or build something out of a house out of clay in the middle of the forest, which is what I'm always watching. Um, those are those are my next books after yeah. After, right. <laughs> fix your clay in the in, in whatever happens in twenty twenty eight, that mm -hmm. will be a, a, a bestseller. The um, like, do you see new technology? Is 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 there a feedback loop where the skills that people are developing here, the tropes that people are finding to improve education? Um, uh, collectively get fed back into the educational system? Not enough. I mean, I think not enough. My personal view, and all of this is, by the way, my personal view, I don't represent open learning or MIT in anything that I'm saying um, or the views of the institutions or whatever. But um, like in, in this new book, I talk about the very first video that's published on YouTube, which is like me at the zoo you know, in the San right. Diego Zoo in 2005 or six or whenever it was. And I know actually, but I, I'm just forgetting, right? And, um, you know, that that thing has got that one short video, which I anatomize in great detail in the book, is has got 11 million comments on it in the years that have past. And, you know, that's an extraordinary thing. Some of those comments are goofy and some of those comments are deeply interesting and stuff. And um, that is the, like the YouTube, like imagine, like that's the feedback loop that exists. And there are opportunities for that kind of feedback right now with online education. But if you compare that feedback to all of the feedback possibilities that might exist by people like you and other technology visionaries thinking about this stuff as, you know, what's possible. It's just a tiny example of what is really achievable in terms of how do you, do you enable that? If I'm, you know, Professor X at University Z, do I want to hear from 100,000 people after they've seen my lecture? M MIT just published the um, last, the final farewell lecture, Gilbert Strang, who teaches linear algebra in May. He's been teaching at MIT for 60 years. Put this online in May. It's got over a million views. Wow. Already thousands of comments. And, you know, if I were the 
20 year old Gilbert Strang, the 20 something year old Gilbert Strang starting my teaching career at MIT now, in, it won't be in linear algebra, I can tell you that. But if, if I were that person, would I be interested in knowing what the world thinks about what I'm posting out there for the world? I would. How do you, how do you make that an interactive experience? I think that is a, a real opportunity that we've only begun to scratch the surface. I think one of the, I'm not sure if it's a challenge or an opportunity or both, but one of the f- features and bugs of centralized systems is you have the speaker and the audience, right? Like it's, 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 it's not one way, but one of those, one of those channels is, is more attenuated than the other. Like somebody has the mic, somebody sits next to the speaker and can kind of heckle, but that's it. Um, in a decentralized system, it's much more like a, a conversation. Um, you know, it's literally peer to peer, uh, that has challenges, right? Like you, you know, if you're doing a performance, you don't want hecklers. It's not entirely useful if you're doing a pedagogical thing to have people shouting in the back. Um, but is there a form, right, in education that 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 is more amenable to that kind of almost symposium kind of feel, right, where people are working together to solve a problem? And is that something that we've just kind of lost? Or is it something that just turned out not to be as good, right? Like you have Socrates, answering questions and doing that shtick. And then you have Plato, who was the person who actually managed to disseminate that to a wider audience by just handing them the book and say, read what they said, but don't right. answer back. Well, it's, well, I mean, I've only come to know you in recent uh, years, and I think it would be an amazing project to, like, explore how to create the future of the interactive learning experience and what if we just agreed for the heck of it that the symposium forum is only just starting as opposed to one that we've lost and what is the what is the global symposium you know the very first thing i ever wrote for money that i can remember god knows is is a booklet on space bridges which is a crazy thing it's these you know, links via satellite that existed between the U.S. and Russia in the 80s. You know, Phil Donahue, that name will mean nothing to anyone here. And Vladimir Posner uh, conducted these things where a studio audience was in both places. And they talked to one another, and that was considered citizen diplomacy. What is citizen education? Um, is that a topic to develop in this new century or whatever? so interesting you know i'm like the the during the time that you're asking me questions in this podcast i will reveal that i'm writing down all the notes that it's stimulated because why not why not have a have an exploration of what that could what that could be um taking the long view sometimes starting with prometheus as you've um, as you're inclined to do um you know can be helpful I wonder too how I feel like people people right now um, are a little skeptical of communication technology. You can't talk about the global village or what would a global symposium be like because people instantly go, I know what it would be like. It would be like 4chan or it would be like the YouTube comments. It would be it would be a cacophony. Um, and a lot of times I'm like going back to what you originally said, you know, writing had 400 years to get this right. Incidentally, with a lot of religious wars in the meantime, while they were still trying to work out how to deal with it or the printed press, um, film 
100 how 150 years is it now how 200 years about 130 130 130. um just beginning to get some universal stylistic coherence to it um we've we've barely begun working out how 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 digital technology should could let people communicate and um and we're just beginning to build this stockpile of, of, of knowledge, right? Including, including MIT, including all of this other data, which at this moment with uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, that's like a stockpile that is being used to produce the next part of it. I mean, how do you, how do you feel about that moment? where we talked about control and like people being a little uncomfortable with the idea of the, their children, their knowledge children going off and, and um, uh, people sort of working with them independently. Um, how do you feel about this, this new era of machine learning where this, this everything that everybody produced up until this moment is sort of raw material for the next step? Yeah. It's great. It's, it's great topic. Like, um, it's a lot about letting go, like the, as you framed it, one way of, you framed it, um, you know, and it does date back to like these, these when copyright was first kind of enshrined or whatever, there's this moment where, boom, it just drops to earth like a Newtonian apple and it is part of the public domain, automatically happens after a certain period, life plus 50, 75, whatever. Uh, I think we are at the beginning of all this stuff and um, we have to learn maybe how to let go, especially if we have a long-term view that it's all about not this generation, but the next generation, the generation after that, how they can make use of it. I like the term stockpile because uh, I don't know what the etymology of that term is, but um it does remind me of a weapons stockpile. And I think we're all involved in a fight against ignorance, um, uh, whether we can see the actors or not, but we're, a lot of us are involved in a fight against people who are out there trying to suppress knowledge. That's something that the Sovietology experience taught me a lot about. I was in parts of Europe where there were, you know, systems of thought control uh, that are, you know, just totalitarian in, in nature. Uh, we don't want that anymore. And, um, we have fight against it. Um, in the book that I did publish, like I speak of monsters out there and a monster verse that we're battling. That's kind of nice. Cause I was trying to get Marvel to pick up the film rights and <laughs> that, that hasn't <laughs> oddly that hasn't happened yet. But you know, maybe if they want, if they're watching this, they can. Maybe they're worried about who owns the original Enlightenment, and that like they could do the new Enlightenment, but then yeah, they get the, sued for the, the idea. Litigious, right? yeah, the, yeah, the litigious Diderot, the inheritors of Diderot. Yeah. So. The. I wonder, what, so what place has an institution like MIT, right, which has um an easy relationship with the idea of moving the truth forward right it's in a domain more or less i can't say easy but 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 it has a good track record of producing things that work and uh don't turn out to be false um what relationship do do you think academia has with um I guess these monsters that you speak, right? Institutions or groups who uh, not only don't really have that dedication to the truth, to admitting when they're wrong and fixing their mistakes, but actually have strong incentives to spread um, inaccurate information. I don't know that inaccurate is the right word. Like, what is the? I mean, when you think about those monsters, like, what is driving them? What is the? What is the thing that opposes open knowledge and open truth? Um, 
Here's a quotation uh, which you can find in the Holocaust Encyclopedia that's maintained by the United States Holocaust Museum. First, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. That's Martin Niemöller, um, a pastor, um, German pastor. Like, uh, what would I say? I would say that um, in this moment when sources of knowledge, processes of knowledge transmission, platforms on which knowledge can be transmitted, um, and more are under concerted attack, including not... Uh, um, at last, um, the Internet Archive um, under siege now from uh, uh, book publishing behemoths and uh, music publishing companies like, um, you know, I think that the knowledge institutions have a particular responsibility to speak out when knowledge is being attacked, when the most powerful person in the world without uh, question, uh, you know, ran the world, ran the United States, and through it, um, tried to run parts of the world as we do. Um, was Donald Trump, and and and, uh, you know, there was no interest in moving truth forward. Um, uh, what role do people who theoretically have that as part of their goal, sometimes even concretely as part of their mission statements. Uh, what role do these institutions, what role should they play? Um, whether it's, you know, universities or museums or libraries or archives. I hope to explore that in some writing that I'm doing now, but um, I think it's a major role because if you don't play it, you won't have any role to play um, uh, when they pick everyone else up. But just to drill down on that um, for a moment, so one of the one of the instincts in that situation is to try and silence, right? To I mean, in the most sort of positive way, right? <laughs> like to try and mute um, uh, uh, the things that you feel are untruthful or wrong, or you even you have evidence is untruthful and wrong, and. Does that work against this idea of distributing knowledge as widely and farly, far and as freely as possible? Um, is there something that is compatible with that program and still can uh, uh, override knowledge that isn't knowledge at all, that's sort of it's, fake knowledge. It's another great question. Like, you know, Steve Bannon's objective um, and the children of 2028, please, um, you know, hit mute or whatever. Um, Steve Bannon, Steve Bannon said, you know, that the goal was to flood the zone with bullshit. And there are two approaches when you're, when you're, when your uh, bloodstream is flooded with toxicity. Um, one is to try and make sure that it doesn't get flooded in the future. And I think you have to overwhelm that toxicity with good stuff. And the other is to develop, you know, vaccines and other things. Um, that's why they're calling the moment we're in, you know, some people, the infodemic or whatever, you know, where there's toxic information, like a, in a pandemic. I think you have to do both. I think that's part of the reason why I think knowledge needs to be shared as freely as possible, especially when, um, you know, search engines like Google, which governs our lives, uh, you know, elevates search results from Wikipedia or that are somehow connected to .edu domains and stuff like that. Um, you have to make sure that these institutions share the knowledge most aggressively in ways that search engines can scrape so that if someone is putting in, you know, what is COVID-19 or you know, um, what is a Mexican immigrant? Do you know what I mean? That the toxic stuff doesn't 
the false stuff doesn't rise to the um, surface. I, I'm trying to uh, delay such that we run out of time, how to answer the, the censorship question or the, you know, rules about what is and isn't allowed. I think the 90% of the work that needs to be done is sharing knowledge immediately that's accurate and truthful um, on the web in ways that it can surface. And maybe 10% or maybe there's some other, you know, maybe it doesn't add up to 100. Ultimately, it's a new universe for MIT mathematics to consider. But like um, the, the other part is it depends on the information. You know, if it's hate speech, you don't really want to allow it. On the other hand, there's a lot. I would give the last word of mine to, you know, whoever it was who said, I, I really hate, don't like what you're saying, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. I, um, I actually find this kind of inspiring because I, I feel that, that um, again, unsure who said it. I don't think it was Voltaire. It could have been Brewster Kale. Um, I think it may have been the editor of Jacobin, whose name I'm blanking on, but who pointed out that if you put all of the true stuff behind paywalls, then only the bullshit is for free and spreads. The truth and is paywalled, I, but the lies are free. Yeah. And, um, and, and I do think that like the nice thing that gives an imperative to is you have to work out ways of dis not only distributing more widely and more equitably, which hopefully is what decentralized technologies can do, but also produce more. Right. And, um, I think that's the, 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 the challenge, right. Is that you, you, you and, Thank you for institutions like MIT. Thank you for writing books. I know <laughs> that is like often a thankless task. Um, but but I think the production of knowledge and the sharing of knowledge is something that that we're going to have to um, we're going to have to up in the coming years. So 100%. thanks very much, Peter. Always a pleasure. Um, and uh, uh, if people want to find out more about Open Courseware. Um, what's the best URL for them to go to? Um, they should they should Google MIT Open Learning first, maybe, and see all the things that we do. And Open Courseware has its own URL, and also Open Courseware on YouTube. Um, all those all those um, things we can we can post them maybe in the metadata to this if that's the metadata, which I'm sure will be below me or metadata. in some way down there. Yeah, exactly. um, or scrolling the Chevron, as you said. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for everybody for um, uh, <laughs> listening to us or watching us. Um, of course, subscribe here, but also subscribe to the Falcoin Foundation and the Falcoin Foundations for the Decentralized Web to find out about new great projects that are um, uh, benefiting or, um, or uh, helping us at, um, at the Falcoin and IPFS decentralized universe. Thanks very much, Peter. Thank you. Pleasure.